Hi everybody. So in today's video, we're going to be going over rhetoric and the rhetorical situation, which is the art of persuasion and the devices that we use and how we're inspired to use those devices when we're writing an essay. Okay. So we're going to start with rhetoric and hopefully you might've remembered some of this from your high school English courses, but if not, we're going to go over it all again and that's okay. So rhetoric overall is the art of persuasion or the art of communicating. Okay. It's when you use ethos, pathos, and logos to make decisions on best on the best way to communicate with somebody and persuade them. But it's also you being able to analyze how people are using ethos, pathos, and logos when they're trying to persuade you. So <clears throat> the first part of, of our rhetoric, the rhetorical triangle, is logos. So logos is key to any argument being successful. Logos is just Latin for logic. So this means that your argument has to make sense. It means that you've organized it in a way that makes sense. Your evidence that you've chosen supports the actual argument, doesn't go against what you're saying, and that you've explained it in a way that makes sense to your audience. So think if I'm trying to argue that you need to do your homework. If I'm arguing with a five-year-old, my logic has to be very basic, that you need to do your homework because your teacher said so. Okay. But as you get older into high school, then we've got to give you a reason. Why should you do your homework? Well, why do you need to do it in the first place? So you need to do your homework and you need to learn these things to better help you with your career path or with uh, the job that you're going to be starting or going into college. So I had to change my logos and my logic based on my audience within there. So logos and your argument. So if I ever comment on a paper that your logos is kind of weak, it means that your logic is a little weak. The way you're explaining it doesn't totally make sense or in the way you've organized it is weakening your argument. You're not focusing in on how to explain it in the best way. The other part of that rhetorical triangle that we have to have all three for an argument to work well is your ethos. And this is your credibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. So credibility has two aspects to it. One, you have to be credible in how you approach the topic. So if I'm talking about in a paper uh, mental health and I want to talk about how there needs to be more mental health resources for students in schools. I cannot bring up individual students' names because I'm not treating that ethically. I cannot bring up um, very specific instances of what happened to individual people or within there because, again, I'm not treating it ethically within that. The other part of ethos and your credibility is that you know what you're talking about. Okay, A lot of the essays that you're going to write for any class, you're not experts on. You don't have your degrees yet, so you're not an expert on that topic, and that's okay. But you have to get credibility from somewhere, and that's where your research comes in. So when you're incorporating your research and you're choosing the best possible research that is credible, you're developing your ethos and making your argument stronger, which is why you have to cite all of your information. So you're giving those citations for the articles, the documentaries, the books that you're using to support your argument. So you're showing that you're credible, you found good information, and here's this expert that's supporting what you're saying in your paper. So ethos is your credibility. So the example here I have on the slide is in a lot of toothpaste ads, their ethos and the way to make you think they're being credible is they have an actor put on a white coat and pretend to look like a dentist. And they're like, hey, look, at this dentist says that you should use this toothpaste. I'm being credible. And so they make it look like they're being credible. Are they actually being credible? And do they have actual really good ethos? No, most of the time not. But they're trying to give the appearance of ethos. So you think, oh, yes, I should buy this toothpaste. My dentist said, or this dentist on the, in the white coat said I should. The final part of rhetoric in that triangle that we have to have all of it to have a strong argument or strong communication is pathos. Pathos is Latin for emotions. It's your emotional appeal. Any and every argument or communication is going to have some type of emotional appeal to it. It might not have an extreme emotional appeal, but if you thought the topic was important enough to write about or to communicate, well, then it has some emotional appeal. This is the part of the argument that, yes, you want to use emotions because you want the audience, you want the reader to listen to you and to be just as invested as you are in this topic. But you also don't want to fall into logical fallacies and end up creating an argument that's solely based on emotional opinion. Because think if anybody's ever been in an argument or a debate with you and you're going back and forth about your ideas, then all of a sudden they just start crying. Okay, like I'm right, you're wrong, and they're crying about it and all they can talk about is the emotional aspects. You've not been convinced, you're probably bothered 
that now you're like, oh my gosh, here we go. The argument's over just because they're crying. They've used way too much pathos. And so they've cut off the argument and now it's a weak argument because they put too much pathos. So the pathos part of your argument is always at a tipping point. You have to find the right balance of how much emotion to use to grab attention, make somebody invested, but not tip them over and make them stop listening to you within there. So both of these examples of advertisements is where they've used pathos as their primary means to get the audience to listen to them. So in this one, we have the very cute baby who's like, look at me, you should buy your tires so you don't accidentally get in a car accident and kill my baby. Ugh. Okay, so we're using the emotional appeal of babies to get people to buy tires. Okay, not usually the association we would make and probably a little bit too much on that. Eh. Okay, because I think not everybody who buys a tire is a parent. So not the best argument we're making if that's our main emotional appeal. And this one, I don't know if any of you remember this from, was it five to 10 years ago, the big gold and white dress or blue, and I don't even remember what the other colors were, the social media trend of this dress and what colors it were. So when this advertisement first came out, you first see the girl and all anybody pays attention to at first is the dress and it grabs her attention because they remember it. But as you look more closely, she has bruises and she looks like she's been a victim of domestic abuse. And so then this advertisement from the Salvation Army is to bring awareness of victims of abuse and that how the Salvation Army can assist in those incidences within there. So they've used both social media and everybody's emotional tie of being obsessed with that trend at the time, but then also having her appear as a victim of domestic abuse within there. And again, this worked really well to grab attention, but sometimes there's that element of, are they going too overboard with how they have dressed her up in this makeup within there? Is it truly getting the emotional appeal that we want for people to seek attention and for people to seek assistance? Or are we just doing a grab bag here and are they actually going to listen to us? So it's about finding the balance of emotion that works best for your argument within there. This is also a really good way to figure out if your article that you're using is biased. And we should never use a biased source to support our argument because it means our argument has now become biased. So if the source you're using is using too much pathos and they're not really focusing on the ethos or logos of their argument, it's probably a biased source and I probably shouldn't use it. So anytime you're reading a source, you want to figure out what kind of rhetorical triangle do they have? Have they balanced ethos, pathos, and logos as they should? And the same thing for when we write our essays. Have I balanced my ethos, pathos, and logos well to create the strongest possible argument for my audience? So that was rhetoric. So rhetoric is your basic rhetorical triangle, ethos, pathos, logos, finding a balance so the triangle stays up and we have a strong argument. Your rhetorical situation is all the different aspects of your communication that would influence how you use ethos, pathos, and logos. Because again, if I'm making the argument to a five-year-old versus an 18-year-old that you should do your homework, I'm going to use ethos, pathos, and logos differently to give that communication and give that argument. I would use more emotion with a five-year-old than I would with an 18-year-old. I have to be much more logical and credibility-based than I would with a five-year-old based on that rhetorical situation. So there's a lot of different contexts within that rhetorical situation, and there are specifically six of them. We'll go through each six here. So on your notes, if you're taking notes with this, the very top have rhetoric, ethos, pathos, logos, and your rhetorical situation then, these six circumstances, six concepts, are all the concepts you need to make best possible decisions for your triangle. So that first circumstance is purpose. What is the purpose of your communication? What's the purpose of your essay, whatever it is? So (coughs) if the purpose of my communication is... um, to get people to seek therapy and to be able to see therapy as um, something that should not be stigmatized within there. I know that I have to be very careful of my credibility, both how I treat that topic, making sure I'm being ethical, but I also need to make it very clear and show support and have research that supports that therapy is a good thing to go to. Um, So another example put here, you know, if I choose human trafficking as my topic, my purpose could make the criminal punishments for human trafficking more severe to reduce human trafficking rates. So I have to understand what do I want people to do with my paper, okay, or with my communication. Um, So for your first essay, your plagiarism essay, we have to figure out what the purpose of that is. So is it just 
to write a paper because I said so. Yeah, that's probably part of the purpose. But you have to have some other purpose, some so what to add to the paper too as you write it, or it just becomes this boring conglomeration of words that nobody cares about. So what is the purpose of discussing plagiarism and how it impacts writers, how it impacts college students within there, figuring out the purpose so you can focus in the communication. The second one is your audience. This second circumstance, I would sometimes argue, is the most important aspect of your rhetorical situation. You have to know who your audience is to be able to argue with them or to communicate to them or to convince them or to inform them. So if, oh, I gotta think of another example. Okay, if I'm making the argument that social media has to be utilized in the classrooms because social media is so crucial, both teachers and students should be using social media. If I'm arguing to teens that we need to use social media in the classroom, I probably don't need to have as in-depth logic as I would if my audience is teachers. Because as teens, they already want to use social media. You want to be on your phones. You want to utilize those aspects when you're in the classroom because you use it all the time. So my logos doesn't need to be as lengthy or as in-depth. But if I'm arguing to a teacher that, I, that they need to start using social media in the classroom, I've got to do a lot of logical explaining, not only why they should be using um, social media in the classroom, but how they should be using social media in the classroom, the impact of social media in the classroom. And I've also got to think about my credibility, because if my sources are just a bunch of students saying why they need to have social media in the classroom, as a teacher, I need more credibility than that. Well, what's the research that supports it as well? So your audience really is going to change how you adapt your ethos, pathos, and logos. Same thing for pathos, especially if I'm making the argument that state testing needs to be canceled. Okay. Um, that's not a very emotional topic. Okay. Especially if my audience is the Ohio Department of Education. They're not going to care about the emotional pull when it comes to that topic. But if I'm arguing to teachers or students or parents, they have a much larger emotional pull on that topic because they experience state testing with their students regularly. So I'm going to talk about those emotional pulls a lot more if they are my audience within there. Okay, so second circumstance is audience, how it affects my rhetorical triangle. Third one is context. This one's probably the most difficult to understand, but it's the key part of your research. So whenever you're choosing to have a communication, there's the context that surrounds that communication. So if my little pea pod thing here is my actual communication or my argument. My context is everything that's going on around outside my topic. Okay. So if my topic is state testing and I want to say state testing should be canceled, the context is things like COVID happening and COVID has changed state testing. The context is also mental health and that there's been studies done that show state testing is actually detrimental to mental health of students. Part of my context is also funding. Schools use state testing scores to gain their funding and pieces like that. So your context is all the things that hit and influence your topic and your argument and how people see it and how they interact with it. So it's all of the research that you need to know and understand to be able to communicate the topic of your essay or whatever kind of communication you're doing. Okay. And if you're doing an argument paper, it's also your counter argument. So how are people disagreeing with my topic? What are they saying on the negative oppositions within there? So your context is everything around your topic that's going to influence whether people agree, disagree, and how strong the argument is within there. Okay. So circumstance four is genre. So this is the style of the communication. Um, a good example of this one would be promposals. Promposals will be coming up in the next couple months. If I am choosing to do a promposal during basketball season, then the style of that promposal could be within a basketball themed, especially if my date is a basketball player or a basketball cheerleader. But if I'm going to do my promposal in the spring, I might choose to do that one outside so there's better pictures and it's warm outside and we can be happier about it. But if I choose to do it within winter, okay, the style of my promposal is going to change because nobody wants to be outside in the cold with our feet getting freezies while I'm being promposal to. Okay, so it's the style of your communication. So you have to choose what is the best style for this communication and what we're doing. Okay. So in the plagiarism essay, 
we definitely are going to avoid the style of humor because it's a, a topic that we need to take serious. Okay, I would avoid a humorous or comedic style within there, but I definitely want to use a more serious and evidence-based style so people listen to me in a more reflective piece within there. So it's you choosing the best style to approach your communication with. Circumstance five is your medium. This is how you actually give the communication. So in class, I'm going to give you the medium. Most of the time, I'm going to tell you it's an informative essay or it's a compare contrast essay. I'm going to tell you what the medium is. But think if you've ever been assigned a project option in a class, they say, hey, you could do an essay or you could give a speech or you could make a website. That's you choosing the medium of your communication. And you want to choose the best possible medium to be the most persuasive. So if I go back to the social media example, I probably wouldn't write an essay if I had a choice to convince teachers to use social media. I would probably create a TikTok account and have a different TikTok series of videos to explain how we can use social media, where it is in the classroom, how it impacts students, how it impacts the teacher themselves, because that's going to be much more persuasive and involved in my topic than just writing a paper would. So it's you choosing that medium. So especially when you go into other courses within your career fields, thinking about what's that best medium to get my point across and be convincing with my topic. Circumstance six is the occasion. Again, I'm going to tell you the occasion. It's your due date for all of your essays. So it's you have to submit at this point. But again, when you're looking at other people's research, or if you get to choose the circumstance occasion for whatever communication you're using, you have to choose the best possible occasion. A really great example was from a few years, uh, was a year or two ago, Mike DeWine was doing all those different COVID talks every day at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. was a very strategically chosen rhetorical time frame to give those speeches about COVID all the time. Because at 2 p.m., most people are awake. Even people that work third shift, most of them have at least woken up for a little bit by 2 p.m. They've had a chance to take a nap, da da da. Or people are at work by that time and they've just finished lunch. Okay, they're not going to be out and about everywhere eating lunch. They'll be at the job, in the office, wherever they are. People will be available within there. So 2 p.m. was that perfect time to give these decisions, to give the updates to Ohio citizens when it was concerning COVID and everything else like that. Okay, so they chose that occasion very specifically. So when you're looking at sources to incorporate in your essays, you can also assess and analyze what occasion did they choose to win to actually publish this piece. But your actual essays you write, you don't get to choose the occasion. It's the due date within there. Okay, so all six of those are your different rhetorical situation circumstances. So purpose, audience, audience context, genre, medium, occasion. Your medium and occasion are going to be chosen by me most of the time, or whatever teacher assigned you that project, unless they give you an option to choose within there, most of the time your medium occasion are chosen for you. But before you ever start researching a paper, you should go through and figure out the rhetorical situation of that paper, of that communication. So determining what's the purpose of the paper. What do you want to happen by the end of the paper? What should the reader do, believe, think, feel by the end of that paper? Your audience, who is the reader? Who's that intended reader that is going to do something with it? Because if I'm arguing that more mental health resources have to be provided for K-12 students, well, I can't make that argument to students. You can't provide resources for yourselves. You don't have those means. So my audience has to be Ohio Public Schools or the Ohio Department of Education. It has to be somebody that can do something with my purpose or actually accomplish that purpose. Your context is everything you have to research. So it's going to be everything you need to know to make a strong argument, to understand your topic, and to make really good logical choices within there. And then your genre, finally, is that style. Most of the time, your essays are going to be formal and take a very serious stance on the topic. But sometimes you have the option to have papers that don't always do that. So um, a really good example is I had a student write a paper a, few, or a year ago about utilizing TikTok as a way to learn. And they were able to be a bit more humorous in how they were able to use it as a learning device and a learning tool within there. They um, were able to reference different TikTok videos, TikTok influencers to make it apply to them more so when it came into it. So think about how your genre potentially can be played within to do that. Okay. So I want you to look at this example and think about how this might apply to your plagiarism essay. We're getting ready to start. This is something I'm going to have you do with every single paper we write. 
because it's that chance for you to brainstorm. Because once you've gone through that rhetorical situation, then you can go back, go back really quickly, and then figure out your rhetorical triangle. How are you using logos? What kind of logo should you use? Do you need to do a compare contrast setup? Different things like that. What kind of ethos do you need to use? What kind of research is going to work best? How credible needs you be? How should you organize it? And then pathos, what balance of emotion should I be using within there? Okay. So once you've gone through the video, taken your notes, there is a rhetorical situation, rhetorical device practice I want you to go through. And so I can give you some feedback on that. And then starting to work on your plagiarism essays. If you want, you can send me your rhetorical situation and rhetoric brainstorm of your papers themselves. I can give you feedback on that before you start outlining if you want. And also keep in mind, you can start sending me early drafts of your paper as well to gain feedback too, if you need that. So please let me know if you have any questions and have a wonderful day.